Today we're speaking to Mr. Tom Lin, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager at MMA Pan Asia Fund Management. MMA was founded by Tom in 2009 and he's here today to tell us about his uh, Long Short Equity uh, Technology Fund. Uh, hi Tom, thank you for joining us today. Um, maybe you can start by giving us a little bit of background about yourself before you uh, started MMA. Sure, thanks Alex. Yeah, I've uh, been in the industry for 17, uh, 16 years. Over the 16 years, I've worked in uh, different capacities in Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, and uh, New York. And uh, over that period, I, s I worked exclusively in the technology sector uh, in different capacities. And in terms of my experience, in terms of being on the sell side and buy side, I've spent about nine years on the sell side from uh, 1999 to 2008. And then since then, I've been on the buy side. So I have about nine years experience on the sell side as analyst and country manager, and about six years on the buy side, you know, running the fund. Okay, great. So you have, um, uh, you know, plenty of experience at uh, major Wall Street banks, um, buy side, sell side and in tech. You launched the fund in um, 2009, in, in October 2009. Why don't you jump straight into us and tell us a little bit about your strategy? Yeah, our strategy is fundamental long short technology. And when we say technology, it's very uh, kind of encompasses a wide array of companies. Uh, my definition of technology really is any company that can uh, lose or win share rather quickly because that is the definition of a company that uh, innovatively destroys you know, their market as they advance. Uh, in terms of how the strategy fits uh, into you know, our fundamental research, we start all our you know, stock picks with fundamental research and we complement that with technical research and analysis on positioning. And finally, as a portfolio manager, I will manage risk around those two steps by you know, deciding how large to size the positions based on the risk I see in the markets. Okay, so, so you take a top-down uh, macro thesis or various theses and based on that, um, you know, look at, uh, take a fundamental view on, on which equities best exploit your ideas. Maybe you can give us a, uh, some examples of, of some trades that have worked for you well in, in, in the past. Yeah, I think an example is probably the best way to uh, explain our strategy. So. Uh, I'll start with an example in the past and then you know I'll kind of move the example through the present. Uh, one of the best example I can start with is obviously uh, a very familiar stock for everybody is Apple Computers. Uh, when we started the fund in 2009, I believe Apple you know, was in the low 50s. Uh, we thought the secular trend for their product was very exciting and thus we invested in an array of names within the Apple supply chain uh, over the next four to five years. And obviously, uh, from history, most people will know that that has done quite well. And uh, now that theme has kind of turned on its head uh, since the middle of this year. And since the middle of this year, we've started to notice some changes within Apple's strategy that makes us think that uh, things will start to go badly for them in the coming years. And uh, this is once we identify a theme such as Apple doing poorly, we start to go into bottoms up views on each of the companies that supplies to them or a company that competes with them, which we would long. And uh, basically any kind of company that uh, you know, loses or gains share against Apple or loses or gains shares because of Apple's business to them. And once we've identified those names, we apply uh, scenario analysis to the outcome of the companies. So we come to two extreme target price, one called the upside price and one called the downside price. And uh, one of the examples of a upside downside name is a Dialog Semiconductor, which we identified uh, five years ago. Uh, but five years ago it was a long, and now it's become a short. And the reason is, if we look at the upside of the stock, you know, we applied a $52 kind of target valuation for the stock. And then we applied a downside target price of roughly $27 to the stock. 
and the stock currently trades around $40. It implies there's more downside than upside. And thus, we would identify these shorts based on this uh, upside downside parameter and begin to look at the uh, position in technical of the stock to decide how big we want to be, how large we want the position to be. Okay, so, so looking at this in a bit more detail, is it fair to say that you were uh, um, bullish on Apple, but now currently you, you, you're more bearish? And, and if so, what, why is that? Yeah, um, so we talk about the success of Apple in the past five years. One of the reasons they were successful, I think most people know, was because they had a leader you know, named Steve Jobs. And um, Steve was one of those CEOs that operated his company with very little baggage. So, and, and one of the reasons he could do that was because he lost a lot before he started this company. So for him, everything he came up with, he, 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 he treated it like, like something completely new. But as the company was passed on to Tim Cook in the last three or four years, I think considerable expectation baggage has been placed on the new CEO. And what, what this does is it makes someone less, uh, more reluctant to make changes, especially on something that was so successful in the past. So uh, a lot of the historical examples like Nokia, Motorola, Blackberry, and other companies that have been extremely successful and then ended up being the victim of their own success. So Apple is in that exact situation right now. They sell about 300 million phones a year, or iOS units, and it's very difficult for them to innovate without impacting the success they've had in the past. So we've seen them slow down on the innovation side. If you look at the difference between the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6S, it's a very good example of that. And we also see them struggling with uh, the manufacturing aspect of implementing very large steps of innovation into their new products. As introducing innovation at 50 million units is very different from introducing innovation at 300 million units. Finally, the most negative part about Apple is the very high expectations. Uh, being a victim of their own success, all the analysts on the streets have high expectations for them. Their EPS this year is around $8. I think next year people expect it to be $10. You know, that's still a 20% growth for a very large company. And you know, I did an examination of the uh, sell side analysts who follow this company, which there are 56 of them. And uh, what's interesting about these 56 people is only four of them have followed Apple before Tim Cook was the CEO. So nobody, you know, out of those 56 people, only four of them actually know the Apple under Steve Jobs. So that's why the expectations continues to maintain, uh, stay at a high level because they have never seen the company go through any su substantial fluctuation. Okay, well, that, you know, that's interesting. So, you know, you, you feel that innovation's coming to an end at Apple. Um, uh, market saturation in terms of number of units sold. Is that reflected in the sales of the success? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, it's a little bit early to talk about how well the sales is going to be, but uh, we track a couple of uh, numbers coming out of Taiwan because a lot of Apple suppliers are uh, located in Taiwan. And the, one of the interesting things we noticed was the enthusiasm from the production side in terms of the suppliers to their parts in Taiwan was not nearly as enthusiastic as the guidance that Apple gave uh, during their third quarter release. So our, our near-term projection seems to imply that Apple will begin to pare back the, their aggressive production plans uh, to more match the uh, lower sales in their new phones. Okay, and, and, and you mentioned earlier that you're, um, you know, you're, you're bearish on semiconductors. Does this Apple theme um, overlap with, with, with that, that with that thing? Yeah, it does overlap uh, quite you know quite extensively because if you look at the growth in semiconductor over the last five years, it did coincide with this explosive growth in smartphones, of which Apple is roughly half the uh, growth in for smartphones in the last five years. If you look at dollar content, uh, Apple's kind of unit uh, ASP is so much higher than their competitors that the uh, impact coming from Apple, if there was a slowdown, would be that much larger. Okay, so you're, um, 
a bearish on Apple and semiconductors. And on the long side, is there anything else that you would like to particularly mention that, that, that you're exposed to at the moment? Yeah, we're uh, relatively excited about um, alternative energy, especially solar. And uh, one of the reason we are excited about solar uh, is the fact that if you look at the growth in solar in the last uh, 15 years, never has the solar industry failed to uh, meet their uh, megawatt or unit expectation growth expectation. The only area where solar tends to disappoint people is the level of profitability that people want them to be at. So given that, we believe that profitability expectations for solar from investors are at such a low level right now that uh, any type of upside surprise you know, would uh, lead to a very strong uh, short squeeze as well as a fundamental buy in the sector. Uh, the sector has really been hurt by the weakness in the energy sector because of the weakness in oil and commodity markets like China. In addition to solar, we also like uh, the automation sector. The automation sector is um, a, a sector that's very well followed in Japan because of how uh, extensive Japan, Japanese people have used automation and robots to automate their um, uh, auto, uh, automobile industry. Uh, there are some companies uh, in, in the world now that are starting to use automation that have not done in the past. And this was largely forced by the uh, increase in wages in China. And we believe that this transition to automation for these companies would lead to much better uh, profit margins because they tend to uh, replace a lot more workers than uh, people think they could. And once they figure out how to do this, uh, make the, these traditional industries such as shoemaking, such as textile, uh, once they figure out how to make these traditional industries a lot more efficient, uh, the profit margins could be substantial. But uh, I mean, all, all automation has always been around, but do, do you feel it's particularly increasing uh, or accelerating at the moment? Yeah, if you look at uh, the penetration of automation in different sectors, if you look at auto, the auto sector, it's uh, over 50%, so roughly half the processes are automated. But if you look at something in the traditional side, like uh, shoemaking, like Nike, Under Armour, and, and for garments, it's uh, less than 5%. It's still very manual labor intensive. So the upside on this side of the kind of the sector is much larger than the um, traditional automation sectors. Okay, well, you know, looking at your um, returns, the, the, your, 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 your thematic approach and, and your um, top-down thematic approach and uh, bottom-up uh, fundamental stock picking to realize those themes has really worked for you. You know, looking at your returns, you've had um, double-digit returns since 2009, year on year. Um, you're uncorrelated uh, un to uh, markets, be it you know, global equity or, 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 or global tech. Um, relatively low volatility, um, little in the way of drawdowns, and, and very liquid. So um, my question is, wh where are the risks and, and, and how will you fare in the next financial crisis? Yeah, I guess every portfolio manager uh, wrestles with different types of risk, uh, depending on the positions in their portfolio. Uh, clearly, uh, our portfolio, given the ideas I've presented to you in the last uh, 10 minutes, are related to uh, being correct on our thesis. So the risk particularly to our portfolio is if Apple continues to grow at 20% and has a tremendous you know, cycle in the 6S as well as the 7. And more specifically in solar, uh, if they find an alternative to solar that's more efficient or you know, requires less government uh, you know, uh, babysitting, then uh, those things would change our thesis. But that is also the reason why uh, we set such a very uh, strong, tight stop loss on a lot of our position, uh, because we are constantly uh, looking for things that could undermine our thesis. Uh, but more importantly, globally, the risk to the markets, in my view, are really caused by a lot of the quantitative easing that most of the governments are talking about. What we've been seeing in terms of the high correlation across different sectors uh, or kind of mean reversion of a lot of these trades is caused by the large amount of liquidity that's injected into the market. It causes a lot of the investors to feel that they have to be invested in something uh, because of the lack of interest rate you know, from their money market funds. 
Uh, but, you know, the good thing about MMA is we don't think that way. We don't feel that we need to be invested in anything unless the risk reward is much greater than, uh, you know, our basic param like the, our minimum requirement. So in terms of our fund and its position in the stock market in turbulent times, kind of like this year, we tend to find ourselves uh, quite well positioned uh, because of the market neutral nature of the, uh, the, the risk taking. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, kind of coming to a close, uh, you, you know, you mentioned quantitative easing. Uh, you know, I look at the, I'd like to get your thoughts on the um, general tech uh, industry and whether you think that is overheated at the moment and whether quantitative easing has uh, contributed to that and, and maybe what, you know, where you think it's going to go over the next year. Yeah, quantitative easing has had a huge impact on technology and I don't think a lot of people link them up, but there's two uh, kind of uh, impact that quantitative easing has had on tech companies. The first thing is share buyback. The, you, you find a lot of technology company, including Apple, issuing debt at very low interest rates to buy back their own stock. Uh, to most shareholders, that may seem like a positive, but to people who want to in invest in long-term growth in a company, you don't want to see the company that you're invested in take on debt just because they want to buy back their own shares. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not related to their core business. That's more balance sheet uh, manipulation. And the second thing is a lot of tech companies have started to do uh, a lot of acquisitions. If you look at the semiconductor sector, I think this year is, the, is a record year in history for the number of uh, deals that's been struck in the semiconductor sector. And if you were to think that this was because the sector is slowing down, so a large company wants to consolidate their business, that would be a positive. But if you look at the way these companies are funding uh, their acquisition, as well as uh, the size of the acquisition, clearly these are not those type of deals. These deals are done because interest rates are too low. And thus, the smaller companies are being taken out at record valuations because the companies think they can afford to buy them rather than think about what kind of synergy they can achieve by buying them. So these kind of factors are some of the reasons why we think there's so much risk in investing in semiconductor technology because of QE and this kind of the um, moral hazard is caused within these industry, causing them to raise debt for no good reason and causing them to go on acquisition sprees for no good reason, very much like the year 2000. But in year 2000, you know, we had a small dose of quantitative easing, but not nearly the dosage we've had so far in this cycle. Yeah, I, I would very much agree with you. Um, well, anyway, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a great uh, interview today. Thanks very much for your time. I just want to finish up. Maybe you can just um, let our viewers know how, how they can get in contact with you. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be traveling uh, quite extensively starting in January. Uh, I'm going to be in Las Vegas uh, from January 4th to 6th. And then the following week, I'll be traveling in Beijing to the Deutsche Bank China Conference, uh, which is followed by Investor Conference as well. And finally, after that, I'll be in Hong Kong for the third week of January uh, for two days. And then uh, the rest of the, two, the next two weeks, I'll be in Taiwan because I'm a Taiwanese national and I will be participating in the presidential election there. Okay, great. Okay, well, it sounds like you've got a busy schedule ahead, so uh, we won't take up any more of your time. Thanks very much for joining us today and speak again soon. Thanks, Alex.